diabetes type 1 and 2, um, the pharmacological agents are used in conjunction with di diet and exercise to control blood glucose in those with diabetes. The agents used include various insulins and seven classes of oral agents. Type 1 diabetes requires the use of insulin. Type 2 diabetes is present in approximately 90% of the 25.8 million Americans who have diabetes. These patients are usually started on oral medications with the first choice is metformin. Insulin is added when oral medications provide inadequate control or there are contraindications to oral agents. The American Diabetes Association and the American College of Endocrinology diagnostic and treatment criteria are used in these guidelines. The insulins are proteins that bind to cell wall receptors to allow cellular utilization of glucose. Insulin lowers blood glucose levels by stimulating peripheral glucose uptake, particularly in skeletal muscle and fat, and by inhibiting hepatic glucose production. An adequate supply of insulin is needed for transport of glucose across the cell membranes to sustain life. Most insulins used today are produced by de deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, recumbent technology, and is synthesized in a non-pathogenic strain of E. coli bacteria, or Saccharomyces fungus. Advantages of using synthetic human insulin include the decrease in the production of insulin antibodies and a diminished risk for the development of lipodystrophy at the injection site. Insulin analogs are insulin preparations that are produced by modifying the strain of human insulin, changing human insulin properties with amino acid substitutions improves the pharmacokinetic profile for optimal physiological insulin replacement. There are many types of insulins, um, including the rapid um, insulin, which is Lispro or Humalog, short-acting, uh, regular, human, humulin regular or normalin regular, intermediate-acting or MPH, and long-acting, um, such as Lantus. Combinations are, include 70% MPH with 30% regular, which is the Novelin 70-30, or 70% aspart uh, protamine with 30% aspart, uh, which is the Humulin 70-30 or Novolog 70-30. For the oral medications, um, the second generation sulfonurals, um, sulfonurals, because first generation sulfonurals are no longer used, the second generations are considered are now considered the uh, sulfonurals. Uh, chloropropanide is still available. Um, but is very, very rarely used and is considered uh, first generation. Sulfonylureas um, enhance insulin secretion primarily by binding to the receptor sites on beta cells. This causes a decrease in potassium permeability and membrane depolarization. The, subs the subsequent increase in the intracellular calcium ions causes exocytosis of insulin from a secretory granules. Other results include suppression of hepatic glucose production through entry of insulin into the portal vein and increased mus muscle glucose uptake via elevated insulin levels. The biguanides, uh, metformin, primarily de decreases hepatic glucose production. It also has a minor effect on insulin sensitivity in both liver and peripheral tissues. It has no direct effect on the pancreas and therefore does not enhance insulin secretion. Metformin also has been shown to decrease triglycerides and LDLs and to increase high density lipid, lipids. The thiazinodes or um, Vandia, Actos, 
Um, these increase sensitivity in the muscle and liver by improving control of glycemic utilization. This in turn um, reduces circulating insulin levels. Functioning beta cells are required for these medications to work. Specifically, these drugs are agonists um, for parasome proliferator activated receptors, which are found in the adipose tissue, skeletal muscle, and liver. Activation of these receptors regulates the insulin response of genes involved in the control of glucose production, transport, and utilization, and facilitates the regulation of fatty acid metabolism. Um, Avandia and all products containing um, this medication has been re required to undergo a risk evaluation and mutation strategy so that products are only available by restricted access and distribution systems due to an increased risk for heart attacks. Actos um, and all actos containing products now bear warnings about a possible risk of bladder cancer associated with its use for more than one year. Other medications, um, the meglinonides lower blood sugar by stimulating the release of insulin from, pancre from the pancreas in short bursts. A patient again must have functioning beta cells for the medication to work. They bind to receptor sites to close ATP-dependent potassium channels in the beta, membrane, beta cell membrane. This leads to an opening of the calcium channels, which causes an influx of calcium that induces insulin secretion. The alpha-glucodase inhibitors um, act through inhibition of pancreatic alpha amylase and membrane-bound intestinal alka alpha-glucoside hydrolyse enzymes. These enzymes are responsible for metabolizing complex starches to oligosaccharides and for breaking down remaining saccharides to glucose and other monosaccharides. This enzyme inhibition delays glucose absorption and lowers postprandial hyperglycemia. These enzy enzymes do not um, enhance insulin secretion. We also have the in cretin agents, amylin replacement, um, it's an endogenous peptide that is secreted um, in conjunction with insulin by the, beta, the pancreatic beta cells. Pranthalintide uh, produces the same physiologic effects as are caused by amylin, but is stable enough to be used as a medication. Amylin is known to suppress glucagon production, especially in the postprandial state, reduce postprandial hepatic glucose production, delay gastric emptying time, uh, centrally mediate induction of um, satiety, and reduce um, postprandial glucose levels. This medication is indicated for patients with type 1 diabetes and those with insulin requiring type 2 D diabetes. It is given by subcutaneous injection three times a day before meals. This agent is, must be administered as a separate subcutaneous injection but in conjunction with insulin. It is helpful for patients with a wide glycemic swing and it is weight neutral or may cause weight loss. The risk of hypoglycemia is significant and close monitoring of blood glucose followed by frequent adjustments in the dosage of other diabetic medications is required. Its ability to induce weight loss makes it an attractive option for overweight patients. Um, adverse reactions, however, include nausea, anorexia, um, and vomiting. Also have glucagon-like peptides, one, which are incretins, um, which are hormones that are released in the gut postprandially. They often are found in low concentrations in persons with type 2 diabetes. The incretin that has received the most attention is this glucagon-like peptide 1. They stimulate insulin secretion in be pancreatic beta cells and have been shown to restore both phases of insulin release. The GLP-1 regulates glu glucose hemostasis. Um, through multiple complementary actions and along with other incretins are known to do to stimulate glucose dependent endogenous insulin secretion and perhaps insulin sensitivity, inhibit endogenous uh, glucagon secretion, 
suppress appetite, reduce rate of gastric emptying, and protect beta cells from cytokine and fatty, um, free fatty acid mediated injuries. We also have the ex ex Nadeide, which is Viada. Um, this, these agents derive from the component of the saliva of the Gila monster lizard and has been approved as an adjunctive therapy for type 2 diabetes. Uh, Viada binds to the GLP-1 receptors and stimulates insulin secretion when blood sugar is high. It is the first drug that has been shown to restore first phase insulin secretion, which does not occur in patients with type 2 diabetes. The metabolic defect is responsible for postprandial hyperglycemia. Uh, the Viadia also acts to stimulate beta cell replication and neogenesis, increase beta cell mass, and improve glucose tolerance. It is given as an injection before the morning and evening meals. However, adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and upper respiratory symptoms. It may cause a reduction in the food intake that will necessitate, necessitate, necessitate adjustment of the patient's other diabetic drugs to prevent hypoglycemia. The risk of hypoglycemia is not increased when used with metformin, but this risk is increased when used with a sulfonylurid. Beta is clearly associated with weight loss. Also have the DPP4 inhibitors. Um, the endogenous GLP-1 is rapidly inactivated by the enzyme dipeptidase um, 4, which is the DPP-4. Therefore, drugs that inhibit DPP-4 will prolong the activity of GLP-1. The first DPP-4 inhibitor um, was approved in 2006 as a once daily oral medication. It was used as monotherapy or can be combined with metformin or a thiazolidone. Um, it reduces fasting and prosperandial hyperglycemia in patients with type 2 diabetes and does not cause weight gain or hypoglycemia. Hypersensitivity to this product is only listed um, contraindication. Um, they're also available um, in two forms. Uh, Linda Glepton is also available. Its advantage is that it does not need to be um, decreased for renal or hepatic dysfunction and appears to have a less cardiovascular risk than other DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, they also are bile acid sequestrants. Um, which is an add-on medication for type 2 diabetes, reduces cholesterol and fasting blood glucose, blood glucose levels by binding bile sites, acids, and cholesterol for excretion. It's associated with only modest A1C lowering, about 0.5%. Uh, Although it's not considered a first-line agent for serious hypoglycemia, it can be used by patients who can benefit from modest effects of its dual actions. A clear advantage is that it does not cause hypoglycemia or weight gain and is useful for patients who cannot tolerate statins. Side effects include constipation, triglyceride elevation, and risk of interference with oral agent absorptions. Finally, the dopamine 2 agonists um, the bro. Um, Bromocytine is a dopamine receptor agonist typically used to treat Parkinson's disease and recently has been approved for use with type 2 diabetes. It works by altering the hypothalamic um, metabolism and increasing insulin sensitivity. The central acting act anti-diabetic agent will lower postprandial glucose levels, hepatic glucose production, triglyceride and fatty acid levels, and A1C by 0.5 to 0.7 percent. With this drug, side effects include dizziness, nausea, fatigue, and rhinitis. So what are the treatment principles? For non-pharmacological treatment, you need to establish goals with your patient. The first step is to establish 
establish glycemic goals for the individual patient. The patient's age, ability to provide self-care, other medical problems, social support, and financial issues all play a role in decisions regarding um, individual glycemic control. For patients who have type 2 diabetes, an initial uh, referral um, or collaboration may be needed, especially if the patient's condition has been compromised. Uh, patients with type 1 diabetes may require a referral to an endocrinologist or a diabetes specialist advanced practice nurse. The second step is to focus on non-pharmacological therapeutic techniques such as diet and exercise. Individuals may benefit from nutritional counseling and physical therapy. Bariatric surgery is used in select, pa in select patients who have severe hypertension and who are morbidly obese. Many patients with diabetes resist taking medications and may rely on herbal products to control these symptoms. Some of the herbal products have potential interactions with other medications that the patient may be taking, so you need to review this with the patient. For pharmacological treatment, um, you would start medications. The first step in treatment is to administer metformin. The choice of drug is based on the mechanism of action and the patient's characteristics. All oral medications are indicated as first choice depending on the patient's characteristics. Traditionally, a sulfuro has been the first choice. Metformin is used now as the first line choice. The sulf sulfonylureas, DPP-4 inhibitors, Meglitinides and the alpha glucodase inhibitors generally are used as second line treatments. Effective diabetes management requires attention to all metabolic defects um, associated with the disease, and this often requires the use of more than one drug to target each metabolic um, defect. If you take a look at Table 5, 53.3 in Edmonds text, um, it will list um, choice of drug and how it's based on the mechanism of action and characteristics. So for the sulfonylurals, um, these work best early in diabetes while the pancreas is still responsive to stimulation. They generally lose their effectiveness as diabetes progresses and B cell function is lost. They've been found to be most beneficial in patients whose weight is normal or slightly increased. Glyburide um, is more potent than glipizide and is more likely to cause hypoglycemia. Start with a long-acting glyburide Long-acting glipizide such as Glucotrol XL, um, glimperide uh, may cause less weight gain and hypoglycemia than, than the other medications. Maximum doses of these medications reduce the H hemoglobin A1C by 1.1 to 1.9 percent and lower blood sugar to a, by about 20 percent. Metformin is another um, an agent um, which reduces hepatic glucose production. Metformin is an antihyperglycemic rather than a hypoglycemic drug. Um, therefore, hypoglycemia is not a side effect of this drug and is frequently combined with the sulfurias in a commercially available product. Metformin also improves insulin action in muscle tissue and lowers free fatty acids, acids but to a lesser degree than the uh, thiazinides. Additionally, it may suppress appetite, thus inducing mild weight loss. It's especially useful in patients who are obese who are given a co the, in combination with the sulfurias. It's, it improves fasting process prandial glucose and triglycerides. It does not promote weight gain, um, is not implicated as a cause of hypoglycemia, and may be more likely than other treatments to decrease cholesterol. Metformin decreases the hemoglobin A1C by approximately 0.9 to 1.4 percent. Patients taking this drug seem to have a lower risk of mood disorders such as depression, especially sulfurias 
drugs were used as add-on therapy. The meglinonides are short-acting um, secreted logs that stimulate insulin secretion. They're used to decrease postprandial blood sugars. They're taken only with mills. And when taken correctly, the risk of hypoglycemia is very low. They are especially useful in patients who have fairly low fasting blood glucose levels, but high postprandial glucose levels. Although they are relatively safe, they are rather weak and are used in mild diabetes as an adjunct. Cost is another reason why these drugs are considered second-line agents. Um, maximum dose um, doses reduce hemoglobin A1C by approximately one half to 1.3 percent. For the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, these are short-acting and are used to decrease postprandial blood glucose levels by binding oligosaccharides to alpha um, glucodase enzymes in the brush border of the small intestine. They are taken only with meals. Hypoglycemia is rare with monotherapy. By virtue of their mechanism of action, these drugs have a limited acceptance because the GI side effects such as flatulence, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Because the alpha-glucodase inhibitors prevent a delay in absorption of sucrose, hypoglycemia must be treated with glucose or lactose and not with table sugar. A carbose has fewer problems with systemic absorption than migatol. Hemoglobin A1C is reduced by 0.3 to 0.8 percent with this class of drugs given at maximum dose. For the amylin replacement, um, the amylin analogs reduce blood glucose levels by reducing glucagon secretion, increasing gastric emptying time, and suppressing appetite. Because it works only in the presence of glucose, amylin must be given immediately prior to meals and should be skipped if forgotten before a meal. Promelantide and, and insulin have reduced hemoglobin A1C by an additional 0.4 to 0.7 percent versus insulin alone. Uh, similar results were seen in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, side effects most commonly include nausea, vomiting, headaches. However, these subsided over a four-week period of time. Severe hypoglycemia, 1 to 17 percent, which was seen in patients with type 1 diabetes, resulted in an insulin dose reduction in, subs in subsequent studies. This medication is given subcutaneously, separately from insulin, three times a day before meals, and contain meals that contain at least 250 calories or 30 grams of carbohydrates. The insulin dose must be reduced by 50% prior to initiation if severe hyperglycemia is to be avoided. This agent is contraindicated in patients with hypoglycemia or unawareness and gastro gastroparesis. It is approved for use in patients with type 1 insulin or insulin requiring type 2 diabetes. Uh, the incretin mimetics is a, a fairly new class of drugs, which is a synthetic version of naturally occurring hormone that increases insulin release, restores first phase insulin secretion, suppresses glucagon secretion, and slows um, gastric emptying. Beta was found to reduce hemoglobin A1C by, at 30 weeks by 1% in patients receiving maximal doses of metformin. Um, Weight loss was approximately 1.5 kilograms in all groups except for the metformin groups whose members lost 3 kilograms. Nausea was commonly reported along with vomiting and diarrhea. Hypoglycemia was common among patients who were given a sulfurea. Uh, reduction in um, the dose was recommended. Theta is administered subcutaneously twice daily within an hour before meals. Um, it can be used with other oral diabetic drugs. And not a long-acting acting release formulation is given um, by injection once weekly. This is, it was approved for use in patients with type 2 diabetes. 
the GPP4 inhibitors uh, inhibit the enzyme that breaks down the endogenous GLP1, thus prolonging its activity. Activity ju Juvena is the first in this class, given orally once daily. As mono monotherapy, it reduces hemoglobin A1C by 0.6 to 1.5% in patient, well, patients with baseline hemoglobin A1Cs less than 8%. When given in combination with metformin, H hemoglobin A1C was reduced by 0.6%. Headache and diarrhea were the only significant side effects. Adjust, um, how do you adjust medications? Um, if glycemic goals are not attained after adequate tri trial of one medication, add a drug with a different mechanism of action. A third drug may be added if necessary. Combination therapy usually is required. Um, if fasting blood glucose sh blood sugars are not controlled by a sulfurea, the addition of a carbose may improve control and diminish the insulin trophic and weight increasing effects. Combination pills combine metformin with sulfurea's or um, biazolidione except um, for Evanderil. Another combination from consideration consists of beta combined with a sulfurea and metformin. When do you consider insulin? Um, if glycemic goals are not reached, you need to consider the addition of insulin. All oral medications must be used with insulin. Because of disease progression, treatment often requires progression to high doses of medications and the addition of other medications for control. In addition to its role in controlling hemoglobin A1C, insulin is indicated for patients with newly diagnosed diabetes with severe hyperglycemia greater than um, 300 milligrams per deciliter, for those who are pregnant, for intercurrent illness and surgery, for renal or hepatic disease, for allergies or intolerance to oral medications, maximum of two oral anti-diabetic drugs, for increased hyperglycemic symptoms and weight loss, and low C peptides. When insulin is initiated for type 2 diabetes, um, usually a basal insulin therapy is ordered in combination with oral agents. Start with Lantus or Levomere insulin, 10 units or 0.2 units per kilogram at bedtime. Then increase dosage by 2 to 4 units every 3 to 5 days to achieve fasting blood sugar goals. Start or start with MPH insulin unit, uh, 10 units at supper time or bedtime. Increase the dose to 1 to 2 units every 3 to 5 days to achieve fasting blood sugar goals. For the premix insulin regimens, um, start with 70-30 insulin at supper time or MPH regular insulin. Um, this is a good combination if bedtime and fasting blood glucose levels are elevated. Increase the dose by 10 to 20 percent every three to five days to achieve blood sugar goals. You can start with 70-30 at breakfast and at supper time. This is a good combination if glucose levels are elevated throughout the day and if the patient is not a candidate for additional oral therapy. The third um, choice is MPH regular insulin before breakfast and before dinner. Use 0.2 units per kilogram of patient's weight as a total daily insulin dose. Divide the dose of the two-thirds of the total dose is given in the morning and one-third of the total dose is given before dinner. You divide each morning and dinner dose so that two-thirds of the dose is MPH and one-third is regular. And finally, uh, bolus, basal bolus regimens long-acting insulin in combination with premial rapid insulin injection. After the patient is started on baseline dose of long-acting insulin, um, rapid or short-acting insulin is added before meals. This requires that blood glucose levels be monitored frequently. One option is to add premial rapid or short-acting insulin to the largest meal. Then prandial boluses of rapid-acting insulin can be added at other meal times. 
Rapid and short-acting insulin can be added as start standing doses or on a sliding scale based on blood sugar readings. This is the most physiologic approach to insulin therapy. However, um, the re this regimen can be daunting for many of the diabetic patients. Consequently, twice daily premixed insulin given before breakfast and before dinner is an acceptable alternative for patients who are not willing or able to take multiple daily injections. Some of the common problems occur when, the pa when a patient whose condition is stabilized by a diabetic regimen um, and is exposed to stress such as fever, infection, trauma, or surgery, temporary loss of glycemic control can occur. The stress response induces activation of counter-regulatory hormones such as glucagon, cortisol, growth hormone, and catecholamines. These in turn raise glucose levels. On occasion, it may be necessary to discontinue all medications such as metformin and to initiate insulin. All medications generally may be resumed when the condition has resolved. Because corticosteroids are counter-regulatory hormones, they can precipitate or worsen diabetes mellitus. Monitor, uh, you must monitor glucose levels closely during steroid treatment and adjust diabetic medications as needed. For insulin therapy um, for type 1 diabetes, um, all patients with type 1 diabetes and some type 2 diabetes require insulin. Treatment incorporates the use of long-acting or intermittent or intermediate-acting insulin to prov provide daily basal coverage, um, especially second phase insulin release, and rapid-acting or regular insulin to provide bolus coverage for meals, uh, first phase insulin release. Multiple daily insulin injections are often used. Open loop insulin pumps and continuous subcutaneous insulin, insulin delivery devices can be used to simplify insulin administration. When multiple daily injection programs and pumps are used, insulin administration can better mimic normal physiolo physi physiologic um, of normal body physiologic. Individual differences in the action of insulin have been observed many times vary, may vary according to the injection techniques used, um, can require for the insulin solution, volume or dose of insulin injected, and site at which the injection is given. A general approach to dosing um, theory for short or rapid acting insulin given prior to a meal assumes that one unit of regular insulin covers 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrate. Insulin therapy for a person who has type 1 diabetes may be started with um, a number of regimens um, for initiation of long acting and rapid acting insulin. These include insulin, um, or Lantus or Levamir, long acting, used once a day, usually at bedtime, um, usually start with 50% of total daily insulin dose, or regular, regular aspart and lisinopril. 50% of total insulin requirement is divided by three for each pre meal bolus. Pre meal dosing varies with carbohydrate intake, so carbohydrate grams or serving per unit of insulin must be determined. Currently, long acting insulin given once a day or twice a day for basal coverage with rapid acting insulin for pre meal bolus coverage is the most promising option for good control. If the patient does not eat a meal, rapid acting insulin should not be taken. Long acting insulin is taken regardless of meals. Um, use sick day rules to guide dosing. Determine a correct basal dosing by monitoring blood glucose levels. If all blood glucose levels are elevated throughout the day or if the fasting blood glucose level is elevated, the basal insulin dose should be increased. Determine of correct pre-meal or bolus insulin is best guided by pre-meal and post-meal monitoring of blood sugars. For instance, um, if before lunch blood glucose levels are high, an increase in pre-breakfast insulin might be
be indicated. If the two-hour postprandial supper blood glucose, glucose is low, then a before-supper bolus um, of quick-acting insulin may have to be decreased. Consistent hypoglycemia given on a pre-supper schedule may be an indication that the pre-lunch bolus should be decreased. For patient variables, geriatric patients, the sulfonylureas decrease. You need to decrease the dosage in renal and hepatic impairment um, to avoid risk of hypoglycemia. The megalonides increase the risk of hypoglycemia in the elderly, and vari variable uh, responses in the elderly occur. For the um, beta, used with caution because of the risk of accumulation with renal insufficiency and increased risk of metformin-associated lactic acidosis. For pediatric patients, the sulfonylureas, megalinonides, and the alpha-glucodase inhibitors are not recommended. Beta for children ages 10 to 16, metformin, 500 milligrams BID, regular release tablets only. A maximum oral dose, only 2,000 milligrams. For pregnancy and lactation, um, metformin is considered a category B. Um, insulin and levomere are also category Cs, include glipizide, gliburide, glimpiride, um, and many of the other agents. It's usually recommended that women who intend to become pregnant should switch to insulin. Fetal mortality and major congenital abnormalities generally occur three or four times more often in the offspring of diabetic mothers. Metformin, gliburide, and glipizide appear to be very compatible with pregnancy. Um, the presence, their presence in breast milk or in other products generally is unknown and their use is not recommended in breastfeeding mothers. Gliburide has been most used in the treatment of patients with gestational diabetes. Metformin has been used in women with PCOS who eventually became pregnant. Presence in breast milk is unknown. It's not recommended uh, for breastfeeding mothers. There's a new movement among some obstetricians to maintain or start women with type 2 diabetes on oral agents. For patient education, um, patient is, education is essential for control of diabetes. Patients must understand how to take their medications correctly to avoid hypoglycemia and how to adjust their medications as needed, especially when they become sick. They need to avoid herbal products such as bitter melon, fungu Greek, and St. John's wort, which all have variable effects on blood sugar levels. Diet and exercise are the cornerstones in, of step two treatment. Self-management of the disease is critical. Patients who have diabetes need to know how to care for themselves, how to best monitor and address individual problems, and when to call their provider for assistance. Meal planning, exercise, home blood glucose monitoring, hypoglycemia recognition and management, hyperglycemia management, sick day rules, weight management, and foot care are important. Referrals to registered dietitians and diabetes educators are mandatory um, for information and self-care. If medication, use medication if a patient is unable to reach a glycemic goal with diet or exercise alone. How do we monitor for um, you need to follow the patient closely. The patient should be monitored at least weekly for the first month. After the first month, monitoring should occur at monthly intervals or as indicated. In non-adherent individuals, treatment with oral agents must may be unsuitable. The patients may not do well with insulin either. Teach the patient about the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and caution the patient to report hypoglycemic episodes immediately. Reduce doses of oral medication if insulin or, um, or insulin if hypoglycemia occurs. Patients should monitor finger stick blood sugars at home. 
um, monitor preprandial and postprandial blood glucose levels to determine appropriate doses um, and adjustments. Assess the hemoglobin A1C at baseline in every three months to evaluate overall control. Measurements taken more frequently than every three months generally are not useful. In some areas, use of hemoglobin A1C levels to access long-term glycemic control is being replaced by the use of average blood glucose. Experts say that this change will enhance the clarity for diabetic patients who are looking to manage their own disease. Monitor urine at least annually with microalbuminuria. Start patients on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB if microalbuminuria is present. Monitor lipids annually or more often if treatment has been um, initiated. Long-acting deglutic insulin can raise by 10% or more the risks of unstable angina, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal heart attack, and cardiovascular death. Special monitoring is required for at-risk patients. For the sulfurureas, measure baseline and at least annual renal function. Assess more frequently if the patient is at risk for renal impairment. Monitor CBCs initially and periodically. For metformin, test for lactic acidosis. If the patient develops laboratory abnormalities or clinical illnesses, Symptoms include nausea, abdominal pain, tachycardia, and hypotension. Patients with severe lactic acidosis are also tachypnic. Tests should, be, should include measurements of electrolytes, ketones, and blood glucose. Consider monitoring P, blood pH, lactate, pyruvate, and metformin levels as needed depending on patient um, levels. Serum creatinine also should be monitored. The current view is that metformin is contraindicated and must be discontinued if creatinine is greater than 1.4 for women or greater than 1.5 for men, but more study is definitely required. The thiazolidiones um, check LFTs before administration. Do not use in patients with increased baseline liver enzyme levels such as an AST greater than 3.5 times the upper limit of normal. Assess patients who have mildly elevated enzyme levels every two months during the first year and treatment of treatment and periodically thereafter. Monitor for symptoms that suggest hepatic dysfunction, such as unexplained nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, fatigue, anorexia, and dark urine. Check enzyme levels. There is a black box. Warning, um, it may increase the risk for ischemic events. Monitor for signs and symptoms of CHF, especially edema, edemia, edema and or dyspnea. Do not use TZDs for patients with pre-existing CHF or recent MIs. Patients given um, a TA, uh, TZD and insulin or nitrates are at greater risk of reporting MIs. Therefore, the use of TZDs with insulin or nitrates is not really recommended. For the alpha glucodase inhibitors, monitor LFTs every three months during the first year of treatment and periodically thereafter. So again, the specific drugs, you have the second generation sulfurias, um, glipizides, glucotrol, glucotrol XL, you've got the um, the clinidides, the metformin, the glucophage, the glucophage rates are, um, Fortimet, the TZDs, um, the Avandia and the Actose, the non sulfurias um, such as Starlex, um, the alpha glucodase inhibitors such as um, Precos, and incretin agents such as Beta. Um, most commonly known. Uh, hormone replacement is our next topic. Uh, the conditions promoting the need for hormone replacement therapy for women and men differ substantially. In women, the decrease in reproductive hormone is often surgically induced, is due to premature ovarian failure, 
also known as idiopathic ovarian failure, or as a normal function or consequence of aging. In these cases, hormone replacement therapy is offered to manage symptoms of menopause and help prevent osteoporosis. While there is some normal decrease in male reproductive hormones with age, in men the need for replacement of reproductive hormones is often linked to pathology, um, hypogonadism, or disease. The differences in causation also create unique challenges for clinicians as they work with their patients as some conditions will require lifetime therapy. The drugs um, that are used, these include the estrogens, um, the progestins, um, combination agents, and the androgens. Um, the indications for hormone uh, therapy, estrogens, progesterones for women, include um, relief of moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms, postmenopausal, relief of vulval vaginal atrophy, postmenopausal, uh, osteoporosis prevention, postmenopausal, uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, secondary amenorrhea, primary ovarian failure and or premature oophorectomy, prostate cancer as a palliative treatment, and certain breast cancers as a palliative treatment. Hypoestrogenism um, caused by abnormal uterine bleeding or endometrial hyperplasia prevention. For the progesterones used for dysfunctional uterine bleeding, secondary amenorrhea, and endometrial hyperplasia prevention. For the androgens, this, these are used for metastatic um, cancers, combinations with estrogen for vasomotor symptoms management, and unlabeled uses such as diminished libido in menopause. For androgen therapy in men, um, these are used for hypogonadism. Mechanism of action, the effects of estrogen and progesterone um, must be clearly separated. Estrogen, both individually and in combination with progesterone, have been studied most extensively. Progestogens um, most often have been studied in conjunction with estrogen for use in the management of menopause-related symptoms and prevention of endometrial cancer in women using estrogen who have intact uteruses. For the vasomotor effects, estrogen effectively treats those, hot, those with hot flashes, decreasing frequency and severity. Progestins have been used for hot flashes management as well. However, because of their side effects pro profile, progestogens are not commonly used for this purpose alone. For ad vaginal atrophy, the use of estrogen in oral, vaginal, and transdermal forms has been shown to decrease atrophic vaginitis. Local vaginal estrogen provides relief more rapidly than the systemic alternatives. For cardiovascular, findings from the WHI study revealed a higher incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke, and pulmonary emboli risk in women taking estrogen plus progestogen. CHD was not found to be increased with women taking estrogen only. Earlier studies and more recent reports evaluating effects on women close to the age of menopause describe cardiovascular benefits. Estrogen is known to increase the risk of thromboembolic disease. This risk may be dose related. Estrogen doses in hormone tr um, replacement treatment are more much lower than those of oral contraceptives. Emerging data based on um, research and reanalysis of the WHI studies have given rise, rise to a timing hypothesis which suggests that the initiation of a hormone treatment at or very near to the time of menopause does reduce CHD in postmenopausal women. For breast cancer, data regarding estrogen and progestin, progestogen 
effects on breast cancer are controversial. Estrogen therapy may increase the risk of breast cancer. However, no change in mortality has been observed and several studies have shown that women given a diagnosis of breast cancer while taking hormone therapy have a greater likelihood of survival. Evidence suggests that progestogen um, may increase the risk of breast cancer. Um, it's interesting to note that megase, megase a, pros a progestogen sometimes is used for breast cancer treatment. Some postulate that hormone treatment or estrogen treatment speeds the development of breast cancer in patients who would have developed cancer at a later date. Estrogen also pres preserves or increases breast tissue density, making mammographic interpretation difficult in some instances. Emerging data and reanalysis of studies have given rise um, to the GAP hypothesis, which suggests that waiting about five years after menopause to initiate hormone treatment may reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. For bone density, hormone therapy shows or halts the progression of bone loss and osteoporosis. It decreases the risk of osteoporosis-related fracture by helping to maintain bone mineral density. For the brain, the effect of hormone treatment on brain function and Alzheimer's disease is another area of controversy. Some studies demonstrate reduced Alzheimer's incidence and others show increased incidence of probable dementia. Endometrial cancer, unopposed estrogen in postmenopausal women with an intact uterus increases the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. Progestogens change the endometrium from a constant proliferative state to a secretory state, um, preventing endometrial hyperplasia associated with unopposed estrogen and reducing the risk of endometrial cancer. For GI hormone treatment, um, predisposes users to cholecystitis. Data from the WHI study indicate that hormone therapy decreases the risk of developing colorectal cancer. And finally, the overall effects of hormone replacement therapy. The use is controversial. The benefits are that hormone replacement therapy relieves symptoms of postmenopause, prevents osteoporosis, osteoporosis and provides improved quality of life for women who experience moderate to severe symptoms. It also may reduce the risk of colon cancer. However, hormone replacement therapy does increase the risk of developing cholecystitis and may increase the risk for breast cancer, stroke, and coronary heart disease. Unopposed estrogen therapy in a woman who has a uterus increases the risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. Controversy is ongoing regarding the effects of estrogen therapy and hormonal therapy um, on the cardiovascular system, coronary artery disease, stroke, thrombophlebitis, and pulmonary emboli. Clinicians must individualize their recommendations about initiating, continuing, and discontinuing hormone uh, replacement treatment. For treatment principles, a cardinal points of treatment pregnancy is possible during perimenopausal years. These women must consider, uh, must be counseled for appropriate selection of contraception if needed. Menopause-related symptoms management begins with lifestyle modifications. The use of hormone replacement therapy must be individualized for each specific woman, and the decision to use hormone replacement therapy must be made in partnership with each individual woman. With consideration given for therapy risks and benefits, quality of life, personal and family history, and personal preferences. Hormone replacement therapy should be given at the lowest effective dose and for the shortest time period possible. The need for therapy must be regularly reevaluated, and hormone replacement therapy is used in conjunction um, with lifestyle changes to manage moderate to severe vasomotor and vulvovaginal symptoms associated with menopause in postmenopausal women. Um, Progesterone is needed for all women who have an intact uterus. Progesterone 
It is used for prevention of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer in postmenopausal women with an intact uterus who are using estrogen. Lifestyle modifications are always the first step in managing perimenopausal and postmenopausal symptoms. Dietary changes include avoidance of caffeine, refined sugars, and alcohol, each which can trigger vasomotor symptoms. In addition, midlife women should alter their diets to improve their overall health and should reduce health risks by decreasing fats, cholesterol, and salt increasing fiber, calcium, and fluids, and, and attending to total caloric intake as metabolism slows with age. Exercise and is, is an important modifying vasomotor symptom, is important for, monitor, monitor, for moderating vasomotor symptoms, maintaining cardiovascular health, and promoting general well-being. Also, weight-bearing and resistant exercises are necessary to promote bone strength and prevent osteoporosis. Walking combined with upper body weight work generally is recommended as safe and effective um, exercise regimen. All postmenopausal women who do not have health contraindications should engage in at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise daily. Weight-bearing and restrictive exercise can be integrated and are site specific for maintaining bone strength. Uh, women in the United States increasingly seek complementary and alternative therapies for the management of symptoms of menopause. Data regarding efficacy is limited and with the possible exception of black cohosh, few therapies have consistently demonstrated benefits. Black cohosh is an herb that has estrogen-like effects. It has shown efficacy in managing menopause-related symptoms in some studies and not in others. Women who have contraindications for taking estrogen should not use black cohosh. The exact mechanism of action is unclear. Um, some publications suggest that there's no direct effect on estrogen receptors, um, although this is an area of controversy as well. Soy is a phytoestrogen, a plant substance that when ingested is metabolized into a compound that has estrogen-like um, properties. Complementary and alternative therapies are not regulated by FDA in the same manner that prescription medications are. Purity, dose-to-dose -dose, or package-to-package -package consistency and strength of varying forms of over-the-counter products, herbal remedies, or soy formulations may fluctuate. Despite these potential limitations, many herbal products, soy formulations, and alternative practice such as um, acupuncture are used by women who experience symptoms. Research has indicated um, that stress management such as deep breathing exercise similar to yoga breathing may help um, alleviate or reduce the severity of hot flashes. Herbal and over-the-counter products can interact with prescription medications and with each other, the information on the use of these products must be elicited, elicited and documented. For pharmacological treatment, um, different medication re regimens affect individual patients diff in different ways, um, necessitating an individualized approach to selection of therapy. Altering the medication subclasses may reduce or change side effects for individual women. Similarly, altering the medication route, oral versus transdermal versus vaginal or injectable, may alter efficacy or tolerability of the treatment regimen. New medication delivery sy systems, such as the vaginal ring and transdermal routes, have been developed to increase options available for women. Research is underway to further um, find the effects of root of delivery and time of hormone replacement therapy initiation on cardiovascular disease and breast cancer risks for women. Some women prefer medications other than hormone replacement therapy for vasomotor symptom management. A significant body of research indicates that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or the SSRIs such as um, Taxol, 
um, Celexa or Prozac and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, such as valfaxine, um, can effectively reduce vasomotor symptoms in postmenopausal women. Clonidine and gabapentin have also been shown to have some efficacy in vasomotor symptom relief. But clonidine is rarely used due to its side effect profile. None of the alter these alternative medications is as an effective as estrogen therapy or hormone replacement therapy. Estrogen agonists, antagonists such as tamoxifen and raloxifen have proved ineffective in reducing hot flashes. In fact, raloxifen may cause vasomotor symptoms in some women. Tamoxifen is frequently used for breast cancer treatment. Raloxifen is used for osteoporosis prevention and treatment of invasive breast cancer risk reduction. For oral contraceptives during perimenopause, oral contraceptives are not FDA approved for perimenopausal symptom management with the exception of irregular menstrual bleeding. The woman and her uh, clinician should make the decision together about the best treatment plan for perimenopausal related symptoms considering risk and benefits in view of her personal, medical, and family health history, symptom severity, need for contraception, and personal preferences. Informed consent is imperative. As women undergoes the transition uh, to postmenopause, her medication should be periodically reevaluated and adjusted to meet her needs. During the perimenopausal years, some women may need symptom relief and many may need protection against pregnancy. Low dose OCs can be prescribed during the perimenopausal years to reduce symptoms while providing contraception and reducing abnormal menstrual bleeding. The dose of estrogen present in low-dose um, oral contraceptives during the perimenopausal um, period um, is approximately four times greater than the standard hormone replacement therapy. Thus, hormone replacement therapy is not effective for contraceptive in perimenopausal women. Low dose oral contraceptives during the perimenopausal years are contraindicated in smokers because of the increased risk of cardiovascular disease and uh, VTEs. Oral contraceptives use in a, is associated with a reduced risk for developing ovarian and endometrial cancers. Research undertaken to evaluate the effects of oral contraceptives on breast cancer and stroke has um, yielded contradictory um, findings. For short-term use of hormone replacement therapy, in general, it should be started in a woman who are who in women who are low risk for cardio um, CHD and breast cancer who are experiencing significant and bothersome menopausal related symptoms during their early postmenopausal years. Hormone replacement therapy is used in short term for relief of menopause related symptoms, which often are most problematic during early postmenopause. Hormone replacement therapy should be reevaluated annually and tapered as tolerated. The benefit to risk ratio for use up to five or more years is favorable. For long term hormone replacement use, when started during early postmenopause, hormone replacement therapy is most effective in treating symptoms and preventing osteoporosis. The main risk associated with starting hormone replacement therapy for women who are many years past menopause involves aggravating silent heart disease. Estrogen should be used only with caution in women with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, or hyperlipidemia. Hormone replacement regimens, um, several different regimens can be selected. Estrogen progesterone treatment regimens include both estrogen and progesterone. progesterone um, and are used for women who have their uterus. Some clinicians use the intrauterine system containing progesterone to provide endometrial protection for women who are intolerant or um, to or prefer to take oral progesterone. 
um, the off-label use. The specific regimen is determined according to the woman's preference for withdrawal bleeding and tolerance of the two hormones. The estrogen-only regimen is used for women who do not have uteruses. For dosage, oral um, hormone replacement therapy is initiated at a low dose equivalent to 0.3 milligrams CEE and 1.5 milligrams MPA. Women must be taught that full symptom relief may not be realized until six weeks of therapy has been completed. Vaginal treatment can be started daily or less often. Usually a half to a full application of cream is used. Vaginal symptoms relief usually is noticed within one to two weeks of initiation of local therapy. Um, recheck patients after three months of oral therapy. Evaluate for the level of symptom control and titrate doses as needed. If the woman continues to report symptoms, increase the estrogen to the next higher dose, uh, equivalent to 0.45 milligrams CEE and 1.5 milligrams of MPA. Change the estrogen or the progesterone if specific side effects are intolerable. If a dose change is made, evaluate the women after three more months. After a stable dose has been identified, annual reevaluation is appropriate. If the same approach is used, um, the same approach can be used for transdermal and systemic vaginal products. Local vaginal product efficacy should be evaluated approximately two weeks after initiation and the dose should be titrated up or down depending on symptom response. Custom-made hormone replacement formulations known as bio, bio Bioidentical compound hormone therapy are individually compounded hormones that are available from compounding pharmacies. These are individually personalized doses that are sometimes based on testing saliva or buccal mucosal levels of hormones. There is a dearth of evidence to support the use of saliva, buccal mucosa, or even serum hormone levels as the basis for titrating hormone replacement therapy of any type. Compounded hormone replacement therapy may provide different doses, ingredients, and routes of administration from FDA-approved hormone treatments. Batch standardization and purity may be uncertain, while using compounded doses may provide more options for dose titration. The use of these formulations in titrating Dose, doses based on serum, saliva, and buccal hormone testing is not recommended. Adding androgens to hormone replacement therapy. Um, androgens are classified as Schedule three drugs because they may be misused by athletes and others who wish to enhance muscle mass and athletic performance. They are controlled under the Anabolic Steroids Control Act of 1990, and prescription or distribution of these drugs for non-indicated reasons can result in criminal penalties. Combination estrogen androgen products are not Schedule III agents and can be prescribed as approved by the FDA for menopause-related symptom management. Interest in the use of testosterone in women is growing. In an area of women's health, the only approved indication for androgen is use is for the treatment of severe hot flashes. The formulation available is a combination of androgen with estrogen that protects against misuse and assists with adherence. Popular off-label uses of the com combined products are to improve a woman's overall feeling of emotional well-being and to increase libido and energy. Testosterone has been linked with improved well-being and improved libido. Combination forms may reduce the amount of estrogen needed for symptom management. Research is underway to identify androgen treatment options for women who experience low libido. Currently in the United States, no androgen products are approved for treating women with libido problems. The Endocrine Society recommends against making a diagnosis of androgen deficiency in women because of the lack of a well-defined clinical syndrome and against the generalized use of testosterone by women. 
use testosterone with caution in patients with cardiac renal or hepatic disease. It is unclear whether androgens affect cardiac risk for osteoporosis. However, they do have the potential to produce adverse effects on the patient's lipid profile. Testosterone gel, 1%, has been used off-label on a short-term basis for women with diminished libido. Control of menopause-related symptoms should be evaluated periodically. Women with an intact uterus who use combined estrogen-androgen products also need a progesterone. How do we monitor? Uh, review bleeding patterns at each visit. Bleeding should not occur outside the withdrawal period for women who use the sequential or the cyclic regimen. No bleeding and no spotting should occur with a continuous regimen after nine months. Unplanned bleeding must be evaluated. Um, schedule yearly physical exams once the dose is stable. Um, blood pressure, weight, height, and thyroid, heart and lungs, breast, abdomen. Um, complete pelvic and rectal exams. Regular age-appropriate screening tests remains important, especially mammogram yearly, pap smear or liquid-based cervical cytology every one to three years, depending on history, trans, sexually transmitted infection checks, lipid panel, and thyroid function. Um, for androgen therapy, monitor hepatic func function and cholesterol, periodically evaluate hemo hemoglobin, hematocrit, and blood chemistry. For patient variables, geriatrics, uh, early studies favored starting hormone replacement therapy within seven years of menopause and using it for short-term symptom relief only. Newer studies favor starting hormone replacement therapy within a few years of menopause and suggest the lowest dose uh, should be used to control symptoms for the shortest length of time. The midlife women may benefit from positive effects of estrogen on bladder and urethra, as well as from benefits related to maintaining bone strength. For pediatric patients, hormone replacement therapy is not indicated in children and is contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation, considered a category X. For race and gender, no race effects have been reported except for the use of treatment of prostate cancer, estrogen, and progestin remain female gender specific. Patient education, discuss the risks versus benefits and obtained informed consent. Advise women that hormone replacement therapy may take six weeks to reach full efficacy. Explain that this is necessary because it takes time for the circulating estrogen and progesterone um, they are taking as hormone replacement therapy to bind to the many estrogen and progesterone receptors located throughout the body. If symptoms remain, the dose can be changed. Dose titration re does require time. Review the side effects that may occur with initiation of hormone replacement therapy, such as nausea and breast swelling and or tenderness, and explain that some side effects will wane over time. I'll explain that the patient needs to take oral preparations with food or at bedtime if nausea is a problem. Advise women to report any signs of thromboembolic events such as warm, red, tender areas along the leg, sudden onset of chest or abdominal pain, blurred vision or abrupt changes in headache patterns. Routine monitoring is necessary, mammogram, pap smears or liquid-based cervical cytology blood pressure as well as lipid levels, these are essential. And the patient still needs to continue to perform monthly breast self exams and obtain a yearly mammogram. Patients on androgen therapy should be counseled on potential virilizing effects. For the specific me medication, estrogens, the conjugate equine estrogen premarin, um, pharmacokinetics, um, adverse effects and drug interactions can be looked up. Um, there's the progesterones, which include the Provera, uh, Cicrum, and the androgens.
for the male hormone replacement therapy, these are indicated for primary hypogonadism due to diseases of the testes, secondary hypogonadism due to diseases of the hypothalamus and pituitary, or combined hypogonadism due to both diseases of testes and hypothalamus and pituitary. Um, therapeutic overview of hypogonadism. Hypogonadism may be found in both men and women. Male hypogonadism is defined as a lack of testosterone production by the testes due to either disease of the testes itself or to the hypothalamic pituitary and testicular axis. In general, hypogonadism is severe and produces male infertility. A mechanism of action of these drugs, endogenous testosterone hormone is used to replace the missing hormone. Administration of endogenous testosterone does have the potential to also disrupt the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal access in a way that shuts down sperm production. For some men, this may be in an irreversible change, particularly when therapies continue for longer periods of time. Uh, treatment principles, you need to confirm the diagnosis by both symptoms and laboratory tests, establish baseline levels for testosterone, hematocrit, prostate-specific antigen, and prolactin. A certain patient expectations and agree on a realistic goals. Therapy must be individualized for each patient. Increase blood testosterone levels to the normal range and avoid supraphysiologic peaks. Um, you want to uh, eliminate symptoms and minimize adverse effects of the drug. For the cardinal points of treatment, um, lifelong treatment will be required. Patients can help. Um, patients must understand risks and benefits of therapy, and can help choose delivery options for the medication. Consistent treatment at the same time daily is helpful in keeping a steady state, and the patients need to take precautions to avoid spreading topical testosterone um, to others. The patient must understand the potential of impaired uh, sperm production and possible imp impaired fertility or infertility. When hypogonadism is present prior to epithelial closure, it usually results in a tall stature with poor sexual di um, differentiation. Males with primary hypogonadism are infertile. Men with secondary hypogonadism caused by pituitary or hypothalamic dysfunction may become fertile with exogenous testosterone treatment. Peak bone mass may not be achieved, um, and osteoporosis occurs earlier in men with hypogonadism. Bone mineral density should be evaluated and compared with aged matched norms, or Z-scores. Bone mass levels should be monitored over time and treatment for low bone mass initiated as appropriate. Low testosterone levels are associated with prostate cancer, increased cardiovascular morbidity, and all-cause mortality. It's not clear if replacement therapy reduces these risks. For non-pharmacological treatment, um, patients should increase exercise and establish good dietary habits for pharmacological treatment when testosterone therapy is in initiated. Aim at achieving testosterone levels during treatment in the mid to normal range with any of the approved formulations selected on the basis of the patient's preference and with consideration of pharmacokinetics, treatment burden, and cost. How do you monitor these patients? Assess symptoms and adverse effects quarterly after testosterone initiation and then annually by measuring total serum testosterone and adjusting dosage as needed. Measure HCT at uh, hematocrit at baseline three months and then annually if hematocrit is greater than 54%, stop the therapy until the hematocrit decreases to a normal level.
do a digital rectal exam and PSA within three months of starting therapy. Because the PSA is an antigen-dependent protein, it will rise with therapy. If the PSA goes over and four and mg's per milliliter or the PSA velocity is greater than 1.4 mg's per mil per year, referral to a urologist is warranted. Measure bone min mineral density of lumbar spine and the femoral neck after one to two years of testosterone therapy in the hypogonadal mean um, with osteoporosis or low trauma fracture. Testosterone supplementation does not boost erectile dysfunction drug response. For patient variables, geriatric patients monitor hematocrit levels, especially in older patients. If hematocrit is greater than 50%, it may present a risk of thromboembolism with some preparations. Be especially careful to do digital rectal exams and PSA testing in more elderly patients who already have BPH or a family history of prostate cancer. For patient education, um, endogenous testosterone can impair sperm production and prevent or reduce the potential for fertility. Um, use care to wash hands after applying the gel or spray. Allow the skin to dry fo fully and always wear a shirt over the area where the medication was applied. Looking at um, testosterone, this is a Schedule three controlled substance. It's contraindicated in prostate cancer and breast cancer. It has a number of warnings. Uh, there is a black box warning uh, on the label of the transdermal testosterone. It can inadvertently expose children to testosterone through contact with spin, skin of another person being treated with these products. Uh, secondary exposure. There are hepatic effects. Use of long-term androgens is associated with the risk of developing hepatocellular neoplasm, except in those patients who use topical applications of the product. Patients should be monitored for signs and symptoms of liver compromise, such as nausea, vomiting, jaundice, clay-colored stools, upper abdominal pain, and abnormal abnormal liver function tests. The drug should be discontinued immediately if any of these signs or symptoms occur. Men with androgen replacement therapy are at increased risk for elevated HCTG levels and cardiovascular disease and must be closely monitored. Men with low testosterone levels must uh, have been found to have increased morbidity from all causes, so adequate um, treatment levels are important to achieve and maintain. Hyperglycalcemia may occur in immobilized patients, and edema may occur with or without CHF. In the past, there was a question of whether testosterone replacement increased the risk of prostate cancer. A study published um, found that testosterone replacement therapy does not increase men's risk for developing prostate cancer. Um, researchers analyzed data from a thousand and 1,365 men with symptomatic androgen deficiency who received um, testosterone replacement therapy and found that 14 new cases of prostate cancer were diagnosed after 2,966 patient years of treatment. For precautions, therapy may increase hematocrit levels. Monitor the hematocrit levels closely. If they rise, therapy may be, need to be discontinued or phlebotomy may be required. For adverse reactions, most common includes headache, hot flashes, insomnia, increased blood pressure, increased hematocrit and hemoglobin. Local skin reactions are common with topical formulations, especially the patch. Exposure of small children to transdermal or gel testosterone drone may produce adverse events in these children, including inappropriate enlargement of the genitalia, premature development of pubic hair, advanced bone age, increased libido, and aggressive behavior. In most cases, these signs and symptoms regress when exposure ends. Sometimes enlarged genitalia do not fully return to age-appropriate size, and bone age can stay modestly greater than the child's chronological age. 
any signs of inappropriate maturation in children and the possibility of secondary testosterone exposure requires evaluation by a healthcare professional. Drug interactions, um, androgens may increase sensitivity to oral anticoagulants requiring reduction in the dose of warfarin. Individuals with diabetes may require a decrease in insulin dose because of the metabolic effects of androgens. Finally, for patient education, um, precaution should be taken to minimize the chances of secondary exposure. Adults should wash their hands with soap and water after every application. Once the gel is dried, the area should be covered um, with clothing. Um, wash the application site with soap and water before any time with a skin-to-skin -skin contact with another person is anticipated and avoid contact of application sites on the skin with women and children. Use of any similar but unapproved products from the marketplace or the internet can cause, can result in the same serious adverse effects and should be avoided. This needs to be um, discussed with your patient.